Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. It's actually a pleasure to be here. Um, on the topic of uh, Charleston, we haven't seen rain in at least three and a half months, so um, obviously too much would be still too much, but uh, uh, we have not had that problem there. We're, um, I think in 71 days now we've had uh, uh, weather of over, I'm sorry, temperatures of over 102 degrees, so uh, we have our own issue. Uh, I was asked to talk about uh, a blade interpolation setting complex anatomy. And um, I thought about that. I had 30 minutes, 35 minutes to talk. And I decided that I had to be somewhat arbitrary about which um, uh, which topics to, to address, because obviously you could go on and on and on with uh, what constitutes abnormal anatomy in the setting of uh, interpolation. I've been just a brief um, comment about myself. I've been in Austin for 15 years. And I've been in private practice, although I do uh, a fair amount of uh, collaboration and uh, work uh, at the University of Texas and uh, more recently with uh, UT San Antonio. I have my obligatory disclosures. I'm so glad I included this slide. Um, <coughs> I want to make one comment. Um, uh, last year I was a uh, paid consultant for a company uh, who is not listed here. and. Um, we did research um, related to that particular um, uh, company and that product, and we concluded that the product uh, was uh, not efficacious and was actually not safe. And guess what? I'm no longer a consultant for that company. <laughs> so I decided to break up uh, complex anatomy into uh, two categories. One was uh, congenital, and please understand, I'm only picking four examples of what constitutes congenital. And then four examples of what uh, would be an acquired uh, uh, congenital anomaly or, or an anatomic variation, if you will. So for the congenital uh, variants, I'm talking about uh, variations in femoral vein anatomy, uh, partially anomalous femoral vein return, persistent left SDC, and then finally a separate aneurysm. So I'm having to look over here, I'm sorry. So this has a the top. The top. The top. Okay. So, so I decided to start with um, quote unquote standard anatomy. And uh, you look at this, and if you're not familiar with looking at uh, a segmented uh, cat scan of a left atrium, what you're looking at here is a PAD, or almost a PAD, of the left atrium, behind the left superior chain of veins and appendage, and here are, in fact, five uh, femoral veins. So when you look at that, you say it's pretty standard anatomy. Well, technically, no. We've got that uh, right middle lobe there, uh, that right middle branch there. And really, where the femoral veins are, the orientation to the uh, chamber of the left atrium really impacts um, how you approach this case. Now, uh, here is a, um, an article that was published in the Radiology Journal, and uh, it showed um, variations. These are just all the different variations that they concluded were examples of uh, differences in quote unquote normal light uh, sided uh, femoral venous anatomy. We have, I've never seen these, but apparently you can see five discrete veins. Um, some of these, uh, this R3A is probably closest to what I just showed you a minute ago. And so you have all these different things, and you might look at that and say, well, how does that really matter with the bloody nipple fibrillation? Well, isolation of tumor veins is sort of the, the mainstay, the, the primary electrical implant that we strive for with uh, a bloody nipple fibrillation. So knowing where those veins are, where the osteoporosis, what constitutes vein, and probably deeper than you realize, uh, is actually pretty important to know. And uh, in this particular case, uh, the right, there's a lot more to the right veins than, than actually meets the eye. As it turns out, the left veins are not quite as complicated. You have left commons, which we see fairly frequently. You have some large areas that really don't even have what we would consider a carina between the veins. Uh, but most of them are pretty straightforward. You've got two discrete veins. You don't have uh, uh, much of a uh, left common branch at all. Now here is a CT of a patient with what I would consider a left common femoral vein. It's, we've actually measured the, the um, size of this vein. As you can see, 
the lab seeker and what the inferior veins, they branch quite distinct, in the location quite distinct from the uh, ostium of the uh, left common. So I think most people look at that and see that that's a left common vein. So why do you care? Well, let's see if this works. It's supposed to be struggling a little bit more than it's not working. So that wasn't the right thing to do. Can someone help? Can you just uh, run it and go back? I'm going to call it the congratulations and then have a chance to run it for this. I can be shadow puppets if we need to. Which one is it? It's the uh, system of the name. It's the ball point. And we're all over the name. Iteration of this stuff. And so I can get the name. This isn't the only movie, so it actually may be worth uh, having done that. Uh, can we run that again? Is that possible? Or can I do it for you? Yeah, you can just press. Press what? The right, right. The right click, yeah. And then just press the next slide. We're having some technical difficulties. Is there someone who can stay there to so only ask you to run it? Okay. So the, my point here is that um, in this particular case, and this is a different patient from before, but you have a lasso that's sitting at the left common, you have branching from the veins, and if you didn't appreciate that it was a uh, left common, uh, which is all the variant of perfectly normal anatomy, you'd be, uh, you'd be tempted to isolate these veins fairly far inside the vein, uh, in the vein structure, uh, much uh, greatly increasing the, the risk of uh, injury and uh, potentially not oscillating the bulk of the, the tissue that's actually in the trigger for the atrial fibrillation. Uh, in addition to that, we have this. Now, technically, this is still put up in normal anatomy. The reason I say that is, uh, and I'll tell you what we're looking at here, it's not a spider. Uh, this is a common interior vein. It's actually quite unusual. Um, it's a trunk that goes straight out posterior to the left atrium and then branches to the right to, to drain the lower uh, uh, lobes of the right lung and then also branches to the lower lobe of the left lung. This is very unusual and if you didn't know this, then you would clearly be tempted to engage the left uh, inferior branch right here and you have no idea that you're actually fairly far inside that vein uh, when you were coming to a blow. So knowing this anatomy, we won't see this very often, but uh, knowing the anatomy will clearly affect uh, how you want to strategize uh, trying to isolate these veins as proximally as possible to minimize the risk of injury. Now, what else does it, uh, what does it impact? I put this, this um, article up, this came up a few years ago, and what they found was that uh, the weirder the pulmonary the vein anatomy, uh, the higher the recurrence rate. And that does kind of make sense. If you, um, if you have really unusual anatomy, you're less likely to appreciate it unless you've uh, had some advanced uh, imaging technique prior to the procedure, so either you're going to be surprised acutely, or frankly you're going to be oblivious to the fact the patient has uh, some extra uh, venous structures that may be triggered, and so the, the more unusual that normal PD anatomy, the, the greater the chance of recurrence. Now let's uh, talk about partial anomalous pulmonary venous return up until here, uh, all of the veins ultimately bring into the left atrium. This is actually the most common um, uh, partially anomalous pulmonary venous return. This is the right superior pulmonary vein. Let me show you, these are two discrete patients, two different patients. This is an AP view here of the left atrium here and the superior cava here. The right superior pulmonary vein drains with a very short trunk into the SVC. 
Uh, so there is actually some degree of shunting here, probably not more than 10 percent. So it's not really clinically significant to the patient. Most of these people, uh, these are found incidentally. They don't present with any kind of volume overload or anything like that. This is a different patient, same problem, same location. The right superior femoral vein draining into the SDC. We're looking at this in a PAV, so this is the right inferior femoral vein. And then technically this is probably the left vein that we're doing on the left side. Now, some people have looked at this, and this is a much less common form of uh, PAPDR. This is actually the left superior femoral vein that drains into what's called a vertical vein, which then drains into the lung and then ultimately makes it down to the SBC. But these aren't two different people. This is actually the same patient uh, in both cases. Although I have actually have seen this anomaly three times in the last two years. So it's not unheard of. Um, we looked, and several people have looked to see whether this type of problem uh, increases the likelihood of having uh, trigger spiritual fibrillation locations other than the classic femoral veins. And um, no one so far has actually been able to prove it. It seems logical to me that the SEC would be a little higher likelihood of being triggered, but we've not been able to demonstrate that. The problem with it is that the incidence of these things are so rare that uh, it's pretty hard to get along a uh, large cohort to actually compare different uh, strategies. So, with a partially normal femoral vein return, there's no real evidence that it impacts the, uh, uh, the way you would strategize isolating the patients and treating the fibrillation. However, knowledge of the anomaly can certainly help to avoid uh, holding places where there isn't a vein, for example, or post-operative um, confusion. Uh, this was one article uh, published by Marcus Wharton showing that asymptomatic at PATDR, which I just showed you, uh, all of those are asymptomatic, can actually masquerade as PD occlusion. So they had done a CT scan on a patient three months after a routine aphid ablation. They just assumed the patient had had uh, a common single vein on one side. They couldn't find uh, a, a superior range in the panic, and they thought that they had included the vein. It turns out the patient would have had that vein to begin with. So, Persistent left SDC. Uh, it's actually a bit more common than the other ones that occurs in about one in 200 patients. Here's a uh, typical example. This is a patient, uh, AP and TAG, same patient, uh, has uh, fairly normal uh, femoral venous anatomy. We've got this uh, branch. In this particular case, this uh, left side of SDC uh, is uh, in concert with the right side of SDC. I know that because this is a terribly large vein, uh, it can't uh, account for both arms and the head, uh, so it's on the vein the left, uh, um, the left arm. Now, why does this really matter? Uh, frankly, if you went through this case, you put a pointer sinus catheter in there to ablate a third, you go over and ablate the AFA here, you potentially go through this whole case and never actually notice it, unless you advance this uh, far enough up to realize that it uh, was actually going some places it's supposed to. Here's another example from Dr. McCauley's work, which was published in Heart Rhythm a Journal a few years ago, um, showing a very large left side of SDC. This is a left uh, view here, that's the right ventricle. When we cut away the ventricular side, this is actually an AP view of the left, uh, precision left SDC as well as the right SDC. And the point that we wanted to make, uh, and the main focus of this article, uh, was the fact that uh, this vein, this new structure is almost always a trigger for atrial fibrillation. So if you don't recognize it and you ignore it, uh, the likelihood of being able to fix the patient's atrial is actually fairly low. This is just a philosophic image kind of highlighting the uh, venous structures here. There's a lasso, a circular catheter here, and a relation catheter here. And uh, they were in the process of going circumferentially around this very large vein structure to so completely isolate it. That's another example of uh, that process. Uh, here is some uh, images, and this is also from the journal article, uh, showing uh, atrial signals as well as uh, venous signals. This is left SEC signals. And the strategy in this case was to eliminate those extra signals to isolate that venous structure. Uh, here is just a part of that, not the same patient, but for a different patient with persistent left SEC, as you can see. Uh, there is isolation of the left veins as you would normally expect, but a whole lot of lesions here in the left uh, uh, SVC here, and the point is, if you ignore that and you don't isolate it, uh, they'll, they'll be back. It's just a, 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 another endocardial view of the same thing. Uh, this is firing from that venous structure in the process of it. Now, 
Uh, that's talking about just a persistent left SCC. We have a more complicated case to show you, and this is actually something with a persistent SCC and a left IV form. Now, uh, I'll have some better images in just a second here, but um, if you can look up here at the Thoreau image, and I'll have a larger image in a second, uh, you can see that everything from the legs comes up to the left side of the, uh, of the heart. And actually there's a cash to cardiac silhouette, and then there's a bridging uh, venous structure that then connects it to the left SDC. So, uh, although you can't see the right atrium over here, there was only two ways to get into the right atrium in this patient. Uh, one was this way, all the way up, and then through the persistent left SDC slash the sinus, uh, there would be um, right IJ, which was patents, and the patient did have a right SDC, so you could get in to the right atrium from the neck, and you could get into the right atrium from the right shoulder. We actually had to use all of those strategies to get this patient. So uh, we have here, and I don't know how you can see, there is a circular catheter here. There is a, an ablation catheter. We don't recognize this, and it was actually a stereotactic catheter. We thought we didn't have a whole lot of manual control uh, of the tip of the catheter with uh, such an odd and, and uh, secure way of going to the, uh, that structure. Uh, here is a um, map, a free machine map of the isolation of the um, SDC. And actually, at this point, we haven't even needed the left atrium for the previous patient. Here's a little bit better. This is actually a movie for Jonathan. Now, what you may not be able to see here is there's a little structure right here. That's actually the ice catheter. The ice catheter is placed from the right shoulder. The, um, this was a deflectible sheet, and this was from the neck. We felt like that was the straightest shot to get to the interactive septum. So at this stage of the procedure, the um, SEC is already completely isolated. Um, because the ice is coming from the neck, this image that you're looking at here with the ice is actually backwards. So this over here is the right atrium, this over here is the left atrium, so it's a little bit confusing if you're not uh, well, who would be used to looking at it that way. Here's just an example. I think this is a movie I said. Mm -hmm. No, that was so. Uh, uh, this one is a movie I think. I guess not, I'm sorry. So uh, the point here is we were showing our uh, gaining uh, access to the left atrium after we've isolated uh, the uh, SDC and uh, how difficult it was to do that. The only strategy we, uh, we had, and I do have to move in a couple of minutes to get a process, we had to use a deflectible sheet. And if you use the dilator within the sheet, it would always pull our catheter down away from the uh, um, uh, faucet. So what we had to do is leave the sheet without the dilator there and then use an RF wire, which is an off-label application for that technology, but that was the only way to get across to the left apron. This, I believe, we were moving? Hmm? Um, I think I probably didn't um, bring in my most recent um, uh, talk. Sorry. So we're missing a few of the, uh, so the images and the calculus for that. So the point is that, uh, well, one of the movies was, uh, that I was hoping to show you was uh, the process of isolating the left SEC in the patient uh, that we were treating had uh, actually a long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation by history. And uh, as we isolated the SEC, before we even accessed the left atrium, uh, the patient's atrial fibrillation terminated and we were actually going to reduce it at that point. Uh, we did opt to go over to the left atrium and isolate those veins, but uh, the SEC in that particular case uh, were playing their dominant role in maintaining the other threat. So, the persistent left SEC anomaly is almost always at least a trigger, it may not be the trigger in, in patients. Uh, and uh, isolation should be performed. You have to go usually all the way up to where you stop seeing signals, which oftentimes are uh, even beyond the cardiac silhouette to, to ensure uh, durable isolation for patients. This is a movie on the left. Okay, this is a, um, an aneurysmal uh, interatrial septum. As you can see, this patient's left atrium uh, for the next, you know, the next one. Um, that patient obviously had higher pressure than the left side, so it was really bowing into the right side. The point here, and what you're looking at here, is the interocular septum right here. There's a twin septum needle right here, and uh, a little bit of energy was delivered right then. And that's what you saw in those uh, what appeared to be bubbles there as they were going across. See how far over to the contralateral side the septum goes. 
the federal trust center. The point I want to make is that if you don't recognize and appreciate the um, differences in the inner septum and the inner septum, you very easily tend all the way across to the contralateral side before you've even gone to the septum. And so if you have a sharp needle and you go across, you'll very easily, uh, uh, frankly, miss the chamber of rotation and, and injure whatever uh, structure it's uh, touching on the contralateral side. Uh, so, um, sorry, those are the two um, um, movies I had on that, but several years have been associated with cardiovascular uh, uh, um, uh, accident risk, uh, not so much perioperatively, but uh, historically. Uh, and you really do have to be aware of and take some special precautions to uh, avoid injury to the electrical core while when you have the conceptor with this. Uh, we opt for energy. What we do is there's two ways to do it. There's an on label uh, way where you can use a uh, radio frequency based needle. And the other approach, which is off label, is to use a body electric pottery as the tip is inside the, uh, uh, the dilator as you advance around and touches the tissue. It uh, tends to, to divide across and go straight across. The point is you try to avoid just using uh, manual force because manual force will usually obliterate or, or basically bypass the machine of the left atrium and then on that risk. Now, before we ever thought to use energy, we tended to use an energy across the wire. So, what we would do is uh, get the needle up to the tip of the um, uh, septum and then we would take out a stylet, replace it with an energy across the wire. The idea being if you can get the very tip of the needle across without injuring anything, you can advance that wire into the left superior for example, and it would give you a little bit more of a bumper to prevent kind of uh, scratching or injuring the contralateral uh, surface. Uh, now that we readily can use the energy, we prefer that we can get safer to just use the energy to get across that than the needle first. So let's go on to the arbitrarily chosen uh, acquired anatomic complexities uh, that uh, impact uh, ablation or fibrillation. First is luminectomy, followed by partial closure of the left appendage, followed by AFC closing devices, and followed by transplant. Now, we've done three luminectomy patients in the last couple of years. Uh, two of them were right sided uh, luminectomies. This one is actually a left sided luminectomy. This is, I think, this is just a, a, a picture of a movie. If you can see here, there's this dense fibrous structure that used to be lung in this patient, and there's really Two issues to comment about uh, with regard to uh, um, uh, tackling the grading of fitting these patients. Uh, one is that uh, whichever vein, uh, line is removed causes a fairly significant shift in the axis of the heart. Uh, the right side uh, pneumonectomy causes a much greater shift generally and causes the right side shift. The left pneumonectomy, this one actually wasn't shifted that much. I tried to pull up the other two that they uh, were done prior to our ability to archive all of their cases, so I don't have those to show you. Uh, here is, this is a movie. This is just going across, and this is just a thorough uh, image, and it actually violates the point I'm trying to make, and that is, you really can't just use fluoro in these cases. If that axis shifts considerably, the four clues that you're looking for uh, to help you guide you in getting across may not apply. You really need intracardiac echo or something to be absolutely sure you're in the faucet with this case. In this particular patient, uh, the, uh, as I told you, the uh, left lung is missing. It's a little bit weird to see the left chest not moving at all uh, with the heart, uh, and obviously no diaphragmatic movement. But other than that, this is fairly, uh, fairly normal. Uh, the other point that I wanted to make about uh, new mechanisms is just because the veins have been ligated does not mean they're not triggered. In fact, a ligated vein is at least as um, common a source of uh, aphid PD triggers as a non-ligated vein. And this, I believe this is a movie also. Can, is it? Uh, this is uh, one of my partners isolating a uh, left interpenetral vein. And that was a ligated vein, but it was clearly a trigger for the aphid. So you cannot assume uh, one less thing to worry about. Now, these ligated veins uh, leave stumps that are electrically unstable and, and we found them to be just as likely to produce uh, PD triggers. They're a little bit harder to isolate because obviously you can't stick a circular path or even a mapping path into a ligated vein uh, without injury or something. Uh, but uh, you can uh, go around them methodically and, and do some more detailed mapping to ensure that there's no uh, conduction into that uh, vein. 
uh, because there's always a stop which can be electric or electric. So the big things with the pneumonectomy are axial shift. It's a bigger, a bigger issue with the right pneumonectomy than the left that can be significant. You've got to use ice. You've got to use some other imaging to be sure that you're in the right place. Otherwise, you're going to uh, potentially injure the patient. And then the point that I didn't include here was you've got to still isolate those veins even if they're like, even if they're like it. Let's talk about um, arthroplasia of the left atrial appendage. This is a patient who had had uh, microvalve repair and had had a centrifuge of the left atrial appendage. Uh, this is a pretty common finding here. Uh, a lot of people say, well, it's, it's ligated, we don't have to worry about it at all. Turns out that's not true. Now, these things get ligated to reduce the risk of stroke. Uh, and that idea and that rationale is perfectly reasonable. I don't disagree with that. The trouble is, if you do it and you don't have complete closure, and this was uh, actually from the Thoracic Journal, uh, you find that um, A, it can still be a problem uh, with thrombus formation, and actually this particular article found that there was a higher incidence of embolic events from a partially closed uh, um, appendage. You would argue that you're better off leaving it alone than doing an incomplete job. Uh, this is also from the same article. We were looking at, uh, we were excited that um, pretty safe to say that you weren't going to have uh, thrombus uh, from it. If you uh, sutured it, and particularly if you stapled it closed, there's a very high incidence of residual connection uh, between the left atrium, and the stump of the appendage, and the body of the appendage. And it also increased, uh, it, I don't have this slide to show it, but there was an increased risk of embolic event surface. Now the other reason to mention is that an appendage ligated uh, um, or not can potentially be a trigger for a fibrillation. This is not very common in the uh, paroxysmal patients. It's uh, probably more common than we realize and is being currently studied uh, as, far as, in, as far as its incidence with persistence and uh, long-standing persistent patients. Here's just an example of a, a, a patient with a very fractionated areas. This was a patient who had a previous ablation, catheter ablation, came back in with an incessant of physical flutter. Turns out that the area of slow conduction was in the stump of a uh, believed to be ligated left atrial appendage. And you can actually see this type of thing if the appendage was completely ligated or whether it's partially ligated. So there doesn't seem to be any incidence of that. So just like the ligated PVs, that doesn't mean you can ignore them. They, they potentially can be sources for uh, aphid children. So with a partial uh, left atrial appendage closure, the problem is um, whoever did it, that did frankly increase the patient's risk of thrombus formation. And as of right now, uh, there's no way to address it other than surgical. Uh, obviously, if somebody has a sutured closure that's incomplete, if you went back in, you could probably complete the job by excising it, but there is no perfect thing used way that is uh, commercially available that can address that. Uh, and just because it's ligated doesn't mean it, it isn't a source of uh, non venous triggers. So let's talk about AFP closure devices. Here's a manuscript uh, that is, uh, has been accepted uh, talking about um, transeptal access. Uh, at, it's actually done through an AFP closure device. That's not the easy way to do it, that's the hard way to do it. In this particular case, uh, we were faced with an ASD that was really oversized for the patient's septum. And um, normally what you would try to do is uh, find an area below uh, the uh, AFD closure device that was normal atrial tissue uh, that you could puncture across. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying that that's normal tissue. Uh, the uh, one challenging issue is trying to go actually through the device itself, and that's what the uh, purpose of this talk was, uh, or this, uh, this article was. So you've got an oversized uh, aim puncture device, and uh, this is going across it with the um, Needle and then ultimately will achieve things. Um, one of my partners is very aggressive, and we did the double concept, we didn't seem to disturb him at all, and going across this uh, AFP closure device. Um, here's just an example, I believe this is a needle of a prime shell device uh, between the inner apple supplement. There's so much reverb on this, uh, the density of the device itself, you really can't see the location very well, but uh, that's the structure right there. And so if you were trying to, to um, puncture, in this particular case, this is not oversized, so you probably could get below this, uh, uh, this um, ISD closure device. The easiest way to tell would not be with ice, but actually with a CT meter thing, so you could be able to see if there's a thin area of septum that you could uh, 
of it underneath it. So the conclusion of this um, um, article was uh, that um, capital of food in AC uh, patients is feasible, uh, safe, and uh, effective um, using uh, using ice guidance means that the puncture can be easily performed. I, I we should have used quotations around the word easily. Uh, performed um, in a patient with native uh, septum that's not covered by the device. I don't find that terribly easy. I think you have to be careful to avoid it. And then um, even Dr. McCauley didn't mention the easy when you came across the uh, uh, ASD closure device uh, going through it uh, because that was actually quite difficult. It took over an hour to get across with a single thing separate function. So let's go into heart transplants. Uh, here's an article that we um, um, published, well, uh, Dr. McCauley published before he came to, to join us looking at a fairly unusual uh, trigger for atrial fibrillation patients with uh, orthotopic heart transplant. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, uh, orthotopic heart transplant, what happens is that you excise the, um, the recipient's heart, which you leave uh, the posterior wall of the right atrium and, and um, the entire posterior wall of the left atrium is filled with thin veins, and then all of the new donor heart is sitting directly onto that. So the left atrium the posterior half of the left atrium is actually a uh, recipient or remnant heart, and uh, all of the anterior uh, atrium, as well as the, the ventricles, of course, is the, uh, is the donor heart. And so this is an example of a case where a patient had had a uh, heart transplant and uh, kept going to atrial fibrillation. Here is a map of uh, this patient's um, left atrium. The gray here shows uh, starting with no voltage at all. This is looking at the PAV of the left atrium. And uh, this, uh, the colored area is here actually the donor heart. And so after a complete detailed map of the uh, left atrium, we found that there was uh, really no conduction into the remnant part uh, at all. There was uh, everything was electrically isolated. And in fact, the patient was having triggers uh, from the female sinus, which of course is donor heart. And so um, the, the remnant was um, disarticulated from the, uh, electrically disarticulated from the donor heart, and then there was buttering from the CS itself. Here's an example of the ablation catheter near the area where the trigger was. They're having uh, PACs with it, which then were inducing atrial fibrillation. A moving, this is a moving. So it's a little hard to, um, to uh, orient yourself, but uh, this is the signals from the circular catheter which we actually placed in near the SVC, but frankly we represented remnant part here. And so the remnant part is beating at a slow, regular rate. The coronary sinus and the distal crystal canalis were beating rapidly, so they were clearly completely separate from each other. And uh, in this particular case, there was no point in isolating that range that you might strategize. Uh, actually, you just needed to um, ablate within the community sinus to eliminate it. Um, I believe this is also moving. Okay. And uh, same thing, it's very difficult to see, I apologize, but uh, uh, again, we still have the same issue. We've just shown you a little bit more of the, um, uh, the other images there. I think this is also moving. Okay, this is after ablation within the coronary sinus. And you may not be able to see it here, but once the uh, coronary sinus was ablated and no longer firing, it what remained disarticulated from the remnant heart. So you had donor heart and remnant heart beating sort of independently, uh, but this was a fairly unusual uh, source of AFib. Normally, with uh, heart transplants, if they have AFib, it, uh, it actually originates from the remnant heart, which is, of course, the more diseased heart. Uh, which is usually had a volume of pressure load for a long time. And the only reason it becomes clinically relevant is if there is a uh, residual or at least an important conduction between the lungs, uh, which develops across suture lines in the, uh, in the donor heart. So the heart trans the first heart transplant that, that I just showed you there, uh, lungs heart uh, was isolated from the donor heart. The CS was actually the source of the atrial fibrillation, and isolation of the CS was what we needed to so this is a second heart transplant patient to show you. And this is actually a little more common. Uh, this is a, a patient that had fibrillation from the remnant itself. Now, as I said a minute ago, when the remnant is fibrillating, as long as it's electrically isolated from the rest of the heart, 
didn't really do anything. The trouble is, uh, we, this patient had clear documentation of the uh, clinically significant they said, uh, that was manifest, I can say, from the general heart. Uh, when he was taken to the lab, the uh, remnant was definitely fibrillating. Uh, we actually could not prove that there was any connection between, electrical connection between the remnant and the donor heart. Um, and we made the decision that there was an assumption that uh, there probably was a remnant conduction that was simply couldn't manifest at the time of the procedure. And so we embarked on um, ablation of the remnant heart to eliminate this case. I believe that this is a moving. Okay. So if you look up here, these are uh, three maps of the patient. Uh, this is left atrium here, and uh, we've already gone through step three. We've already identified that the remnant is fibrillating. I think I have some better images of this in a second. And as you can see, we're ablating the posterior wall. Uh, really, this is very similar to a standard permanent uh, insanity isolation. It doesn't feel like it because it's a transplant patient, but, um, but really what you're trying to do is isolate that posterior wall isolate the antrum of those pulmonary veins, and don't forget the posterior wall of the right atrium, which is also electrically connected to that, that remnant tissue in the wall. So as we go through, I believe this is also moving. Uh, as we isolate, this is just ablating among the septum areas that we're still having uh, um, firing. As this progressed, the remnant slowed and became more and more organized. Here is just a, uh, an AP view of what happened is actually a bit easier to see in the PA view here. Uh, this is a PA view. Uh, this green is the left atrial remnant. Uh, this gray is the right atrial remnant here. And uh, the SEC, the posterior wall of the right atrium, as well as the posterior area uh, around the pinnacle lines on the left atrium were also isolated. And once that was done, the patient was uh, completely non-inducible. And I really uh, you know, has no longer had any evidence of uh, of fibrillation. So there was a little bit of a gamble. We couldn't find any other reason for the patient fibrillating, and so that seemed like the, um, the only strategy to address in this case. So with heart transplants, um, obviously uh, anatomy changes uh, impact the aphid mechanism. It can be coming from the remnant, or less commonly, it can be coming from the donor heart. And uh, you have to be aware of the suture lining. You have to be aware of uh, where they may have uh, um, conduction across the incision lining uh, that can impact your uh, your aphid. And then triggers can become can come from either, uh, either source. So in summary, I'm going to note that I'm almost out of time. Uh, complex anatomy requires uh, modifications in the strategy to maximize efficacy and, and minimize risk. Uh, some pre-procedure imaging can certainly help, if nothing else, to avoid surprises. I'm not going to be here to tell you that you've got to get CTs on every patient. There is a significant amount of radiation. But the more you know about the anatomy, the more you appreciate that, the less likely you are to make a mistake and the less likely you are to waste time in the case looking for things that may or may not be there. And then the ablation strategy, um, frankly, must be tailored to the arrhythmia, but also with um, careful consideration for the economy and uh, any time from the problem in Thank you.